All right, I believe that we are live on Facebook and on YouTube if you're watching this later. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. This is our latest installment of the Virtual Views and Brews. Tonight, we have the Volcanic Sublime, Mount St. Helens in the History of Art with our curator, Dawson Carr. To tell you a little bit about Mount St. Helens Institute, we have been around since 1996 and we're proud to advance the understanding and stewardship of the earth through science, education, and exploration of volcanic landscapes. And we now have the opportunity to do so virtually. Together, we believe in the power of science to help lead us down the right path, solve problems, inspire critical thinking, and make the world a better place. We believe the natural world around us is an irreplaceable resource to be respected, loved, understood, and cared for. Altogether, we are committed to diversity and equity and inclusion throughout our organization's culture, policies, curriculum, programs, and partnerships, and believe that everyone should have the opportunity to enjoy Mount St. Helens. We always have, and we always will. And no matter where you're joining us from tonight, we encourage you to recognize and learn about the indigenous land on which you live. Mount St. Helens Institute operates on the land of the Cowlitz tribe and the confederated bands and tribes of the Yakima Nation. We're honored to have the Cowlitz tribe as part uh, as a partner and they fill multiple seats on our board of directors and together we offer joint programming to Cowlitz youth and the general public. And if you enjoy views and brews consider making a donation to ensure that we can continue providing this great event now virtual. Uh, there's a, we'll put a link in the live stream descri description here on Facebook um, that will take you to our donation page and thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. Throughout the evening, we'll be collecting questions via our Facebook chat on the live stream. So feel free to send a message for our speaker, Dawson Carr. I'll collect them to be answered at the end. So to all of you out there joining us tonight, whatever your brew is, I've got homemade kombucha here. Cheers to you, cheers to Dawson. Thank you for joining us. So tonight we present the volcanic sublime, Mount St. Helens in the history of art. Dawson Carr is the Janet and Richard Geary Curator of European Art at the Portland Art Museum. And he's also a volcano enthusiast. Welcome, Dawson. Thanks, Taylor. It's great to be here. I'm going to share my screen. This talk had its origins when the folks from the Mount St. Helens Institute uh, came to visit us at the Portland Art Museum to begin planning our partnership, uh, our partnerships around uh, the exhibition Volcano uh, Mount St. Helens in Art. Um, I should mention before we start this evening that you can check out that exhibition uh, virtually. The virtual show is available on our website. You go to our website, the exhibitions page, find the exhibition, and from there you can go and view at length good photographs of most of the works of art in the show. Because of the pandemic, we weren't really able to gather everything together, uh, but really only about a dozen things are, are, are missing. When the Mount St. Helens Institute staff came to visit us. I took them upstairs to the European galleries to show them this our one historic volcano picture. Um, when I came to Portland to interview for the job, I, I said to the director at the time, I can't believe you don't have a, a painting like this in, in your collection with uh, the magnificent volcanoes on your horizon. And indeed, one of the first things that uh, we bought after my arrival <clears throat> was this little picture. Um, and we'll come back to it in a bit. But in showing it, I came around to the 18th and 19th century notions of the sublime. That is sublime used um, as a noun. Here's the definition from the Oxford Dictionary of American English, and you'll find no noun here uh, today, uh, even though it is still used by philosophers and, and people who study aesthetics. It's here most, and most commonly is used as an adjective uh, of such ex excellence, grandeur, or beauty as to inspire great admiration or awe. 
There are other meanings. There's the chemical definition, uh, an archaic definition about uh, a language or the like uh, uh, elevating you to a high degree of moral or spiritual purity or excellence. But when we use it as a noun, we refer both to the object and the human experience of just such a moment as Friedrich depicts in uh, this painting. Uh, I wager that most of the listeners today have had this experience, even if our garb and our vistas are not the same. <clears throat> Climbing mountains uh, is, of course, a, a metaphor for life itself. Uh, we have a goal and we, with great efforts, haul ourselves up to a high viewpoint. And once there, we're rewarded with a glorious vista that transports us to a very special place in human consciousness. The view of uh, a landscape from such a high place uh, makes us feel small in the cosmos as we look out on the vast terrain. And in this case, the mists that fill uh, the spaces between the mountains that seem to go on forever. Feeling small in the cosmos might engender a degree of fear. Uh, but for many of us, it also simultaneously taps the mind's capacity for transcendental comprehension. I thought I would segue straight away to Mount St. Helens in this wonderful photograph by Diane Cook and Len Jensel um, that shows uh, the mists. Uh, this was an aerial shot um, and an absolutely exquisite photograph with the patterning of dark and light um, in the glaciers lying um, on the mountain, juxtaposed with the light and dark of the mist and the mountains reading through off into the distance. Most of the very earliest views of Mount St. Helens, those from the mid 1840s, are documentary. Uh, they were made by travelers, visitors to the area, in this case, a British spy um, who happened uh, to see the mountain erupting, steam and ash from a vent on the north side. When we get into real images of Mount St. Helens, they become different. They're not just of interest for their topography, even when they show a volcanic eruption. We're looking at a vista like this, and the paintings, the early 19th century paintings of Mount St. Helens, mostly relate to the great tradition of the American sublime, as it's called, um, in this school of luminism that originated with uh, painters. They're called the Hudson River School. Um, they didn't just portray the Hudson River by any means, and it was a rather uh, very loose uh, group, uh, not all of whom would have necessarily gotten along. And one of the leading exponents was Thomas Cole. He'd been off to Europe just before he painted this picture, and he came back fired up to apply the traditions that he had learned in Europe to the great American landscape. And we see this wonderful oxbow in the Connecticut uh, River here. And viewed from high up, the painter you can see, there he is uh, perched, taking in the scene. And Cole described this painting as combining the picturesque and the sublime. By the picturesque, he meant the beauty of this, this form of the oxbow. And by the sublime, he meant the beauty of this approaching storm, something slightly threatening. The American school went on to discover uh, the great monuments in the western part of the country. Um, here's the great Albert Bierstadt uh, doing Yosemite Valley. The school 
of artists is called, or uh, the type of art is called luminism, uh, because it usually um, emphasizes beautiful, dramatic effects of light, effects that take our breath away in, in front of such a scene as this. And here in the Sierra Nevada, um, again, Bierstadt, an almost otherworldly light. And one thing that you'll notice about most of these pictures is the lack of human presence. Not such grand pictures portray Mount St. Helens. They're much more modest in scale and they relate to the luminist tradition in American art uh, represented in paintings like this one by Kensett. Um, note how much more subtle the play of light is uh, in the sky and across the, uh, the landscape and across the surface of the water as well. And we see this in some of the earliest paintings uh, of Mount St. Helens. William Samuel, Samuel Parrott was a, was a local artist um, and uh, developed quite a following of other artists here in Portland. And in this beautiful depiction of, of Mount St. Helens, we see this play of subtle light of a foreground much lower and uh, uh, with giant trees looking out onto the majestic mountain, emphasizing its beautiful conical shape. His pupil, Grace Russell Fountain, uh, painted this work, also very, very luminous. This it illustrates the real beauty of oil paint. Oil paint is, is, is translucent and she's used a white ground and the, and the light is passing through the paint, bouncing off that ground and back to create this beautiful luminous scene. The only uh, artist of international renown to have portrayed Mount St. Helens in these early days was Albert Bierstadt, who passed through this area twice. Um, this view was taken in, in about 1889 on his second trip to the area. And here you see this tradition being played out again, uh, light playing across the, the, the landscape, the mountains, the water, a mist uh, rising above the water, and against, against the autumnal colors that you see on the mountainside at left. And here, the scene being taken in by two deer. Bierstadt knew the area well. I, I think this work was painted uh, in just about the same time. And many of you will remember this work uh, from the Portland Art Museum collection depicting Mount Hood. Um, Bierstadt depicted Mount Hood quite a few times, uh, but that was not so true of Mount St. Helens. I should also say that this work is about mm, six times the size of his view of Mount St. Helens. I'm shifting back to um, this luminous view of Yosemite Valley um, to make a point. And this is a very, very grand, large picture. Um, and, but here you see the effects of sunlight being dappled onto this piece of slate um, by a lovely uh, artist, uh, Eliza Barkas. This has ended up being a really popular work in the show. People relate to it. And part of the sublime has to do with light and our experience of beautiful manifestations of light, like sunsets. Artists at this time tended to either show their scenes at noon or at sunset, sometimes sunrise. I should say this slate. I wanted to make the point, this is not a grand picture. Eliza Barkas had a big family to support and she was one of the originators of color postcards. And this was certainly painted to appeal to uh, the tourist market. Now I'm gonna take you back in time a bit to try to hone in on a, a proper definition of the sublime. 
Um, this is one of the great, great landscape painters of the 18th century, Claude Joseph Vernet. And painters at the time, Vernet among them, um, loved to create pairs of pictures that illustrate differences between notions of the beautiful and the sublime. For the philosopher Edmund Burke in the mid 18th century, the sublime was in essence a, an antonym for beautiful. It meant something distinctly different. This picture showing a beautiful moonlit bay, calm waters, people enjoying the evening around a campfire, a fisherman ending their day. And it is juxtaposed with this view representing the sublime, beautiful, but also terrifying. And the sublime often comes back around um, to one of the eternal themes uh, uh, of, of humankind, and that is our struggles with nature. Ships, shipwrecks uh, here, we, we, we see a storm, lightning bolt, uh, a, a ship has been dashed against the rocks and people are escaping, um, uh, climbing uh, uh, along and swinging over to, to reach safety. Some joyous to have made it, others thoroughly exhausted by the experience, a little bit of saving of the cargo, um, but a very dramatic scene. So I'm gonna go back, the beautiful and the sublime. Here you see them together. They weren't really meant to hang side by side. Pendants are usually separated by something, a window, a mirror, um, a piece of sculpture uh, or, the, or, or the like. But the comparison between the two was invited and savored by people. Shipwreck pictures were made independently as well uh, in and for themselves. And we have this wonderful example in, in the Portland Art Museum. And it beautifully shows the contrast and, and how unpredictable storms are in juxtaposing this clear sunny sky with this storm that has moved in uh, from the ocean and has dashed uh, this ship against the shore. Note the two figures rushing up, having saved themselves from the water here. We don't have uh, a picture of a calm scene uh, to hang juxtaposed with this work. And so we hang with it, uh, Fidanza's eruption of Vesuvius. And they both illustrate the 18th century idea of the sublime as the overwhelming force uh, of nature against humankind. Um, and in this case, it's a, it's a lovely juxtaposition because you have the forces of water and wind juxtaposed with the forces of earth and fire. I should say that very briefly that such threats to humankind as a shipwreck were also played out on a monumental scale. I've provided you with an image of the painting hanging in the Louvre. It's 24 feet or thereabouts wide the figures over life size, and it illustrates a real happening of the wreck of the French frigate, the Medusa, um, off Mauritania. And it, this had happened just a few years before the painting of the picture, and 150 some odd people uh, made it on to a hastily uh, constructed raft, and only 15 survived uh, the grueling 13 days at sea that was to come. Here you see them trying to signal to a, a ship on the horizon. Um, this was a great scandal at the time. This is, this is uh, pointing fingers at uh, the ship's captain who, who was indeed incompetent and abandoned uh, uh, the people. Um, and uh, I mean, this is virtually uh, 
how the people of Beirut must feel about their government about this point. Um, anyway, the trying to get at the sublime also involved paintings that were primarily figural like this, where the overall effects of nature are seen around the edges, but where human reaction comes into play. It wasn't just the effects of uh, water in the vast, unknowable sea, uh, but it was also the effects of frozen water. Um, this is a big painting depicting an avalanche in the Alps, uh, a bridge being crushed by it. We wonder if this was their only way out um, and arms raised to heaven against the thundering snow. This is by the same painter as the wanderer above the mist that we saw at first. Uh, and it shows a ship, oh, a ship having been caught uh, in the ice and being crushed and subsumed beneath it. Uh, this was the age of exploration, trying to find the Northwest Passage, um, uh, Arctic exploration uh, in, in general. Uh, many were caught um, uh, unawares of the rigors. And so it really captured a uh, public imagination, such scenes as this. And here by the great American painter, Frederick Eden Church, um, massive icebergs. This is a, a colossal picture about 18 feet across um, with the remnants of a broken up ship on the bergs looking very majestic. Of course, in the century and a half that has elapsed since this painting was made, um, our relationship with ice has uh, significantly changed because in that time, the earth has warmed uh, uh, more rapidly than at any time in the history of this planet. And I want to segue a, a bit improbably into a work of contemporary art that I'd like to show you in this context, because it also represents sub, uh, the sublimity of nature. It's a work by uh, a great contemporary artist, Olafur Eliasson, uh, and this project, known as Ice Watch, began with him collecting small icebergs broken off from the Greenland uh, ice sheet and transporting them via refrigerated containers to Copenhagen, where they were set up in front of the city hall. As you can see, he's arranged 12 bergs in a circle at the points of the hours of the day to emphasize uh, uh, the passage of time. And this was October in 2014 in, in Copenhagen, and it took less than a week for them to all but disappear. And so it was a truly vivid demonstration of what is happening uh, to our planet. And of course, since 2014, um, we've seen horrific scenes of the ice sheet in Greenland breaking up. He did it again in London, this time with 24 bergs uh, displayed outside Tate Modern. And he admitted up front that doing these projects took, uh, established an incredible carbon footprint. Um, he recognized it, but for him, the importance of bringing home uh, the absolutely imperative nature of this moment in human history, uh, raising awareness of climate change by providing a direct and tangible experience of the reality of melting Arctic ice. As you can see, it was very palpable for people. It was also oral, the melting ice, giving off those wonderful sounds that you've experienced traversing a uh, glacier. And yes, you can even lick it and, and taste a bit of ice laid down millennia ago. This uh, image 
illustrates rather profoundly um, why we need to be acting on climate change now. There's the artist. Uh, if you don't know him, uh, I, I really recommend you visit his website. He's incredibly bright and has created some of the most compelling art um, in recent memory. Now, from the disasters um, at sea, um, I, I should also go back and just say, our relationship here is different because in expressions of, sublime, of the sublime, they most often concentrate on nature overwhelming humans. But this is a project that is all about emphasizing how we are affecting this massive planet uh, in a very negative way. So from avalanches, shipwrecks and the like, um, we move to eruptions of Vesuvius. Vesuvius was quiet from the year 79 when it buried her, uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum until 1632 when it erupted again with a vengeance. And that eruptive period was to last 300 years. And so in the 18th and 19th century, Vesuvius was on the European continent demonstrating the sublime better than any other force with its massive eruptions. And of course, eruptions are the most visually spectacular of, na of, of nature's manifestations of its power. And so they naturally became uh, a subject for artists. One of the great specialists in the area was Volaire. And Volaire created uh, this eruption of Vesuvius early in his uh, career. He, he painted all kinds of coastal scenes he, uh, uh, like Vernet, uh, but um, once he moved to Naples, experienced Vesuvius erupting, Vesuvius became his subject. And this is the first kind of picture he created. And you can see the volcano erupting, uh, lightning in the, in the sky. Um, as you've probably noticed already, often the fiery, hot spectacle juxtaposed uh, with the serene, very dependable cycles of the moon. And here we have nature at its most unpredictable. But people are fleeing across the Magdalena Bridge and into Naples, winding around. Here a monk is exhorting uh, people to pray for the eruption to stop. Uh, to stop. And Volaire very quickly discovered that this was not the kind of painting that rich travelers on the grand tour wanted to take home. They wanted to see themselves. And so this kind of picture became much more common, showing people taking in the awesome sight. Um, this brings back memories for all of us of, of images of people uh, watching uh, in Hawaii recently. Scale has a great deal to do with something being sublime, being truly great. And one of the ways that artists mimicked uh, the grand scale of, of a volcanic eruption was to paint on a very grand scale. This is an enormous picture in Chicago, uh, as is this one. And I, I forgot to mention, uh, many of you will remember it from when we showed landscapes uh, from the collection of the late Paul Allen. These kinds of eruptions of Vesuvius were, were produced for tourists. Um, remember, photography isn't uh, invented just yet. Um, were produced for tourists in huge numbers, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of them. This uh, a much smaller and more modest picture, but a wonderful picture, um, beautifully illustrating volcanic bombs, the clots of uh, molten lava that get ejected by the volcano and assume these aerodynamic uh, shapes in flight. Here we 
view the eruption from a safe distance, as do the Turks in the foreground. Uh, Turks were a, a feature often seen in Naples because Naples was the uh, main port for trade with the Ottoman Empire. Wonderful effects of light on the Bay of Naples uh, as well. And again, uh, juxtaposing the heat on the left with the serene coolness uh, of the full moon on the right. When he came to Mount St. Helens, um, Paul Kane was in the area just a few years after uh, Henry James Ware, whose work I showed you in the beginning. And he also witnessed a steam and ash eruption from a vent on the north side. But when he went home to Toronto, he wanted to paint a picture remembering this. And he made it a fiery eruption, just like the, the pictures of Vesuvius erupting that he had seen on his tour uh, of Europe many years before. And so you can never totally uh, believe artists. This, this is hardly naturalistic or documentary. It was really a painting about creating these spectacular um, pyrotechnics uh, at night. In this case, the Turks, uh, uh, looking at Vesuvius, have been replaced by Native Americans in a canoe. Back to Vesuvius, uh, just quickly. In time, for some artists, like Joseph Wright, um, the scene of Vesuvius erupting became quasi-apocalyptic. And here we see this vortex of, of cloud surrounding uh, the eruption plume. Apocalyptic scenes of Vesuvius's destruction in the year 79 uh, were painted by uh, the great John Martin on a colossal scale. We see Vesuvius erupting here, about to bury Pompeii and Herculaneum as people uh, try to flee. John Martin, some years later, turned his attention to imagining the end of time uh, in, in this marvelous, also very large picture, uh, the great day of his wrath, where uh, the earth comes apart and turns in on itself, destroying the, all the things of man and humans being tossed into the abyss. We, of course, the Victorian public loved being terrified, tintillated uh, by such scenes, uh, most of them believing Christians. And we still, regardless of faith, enjoy this kind of pleasurable terror uh, that is represented in the sublime in disaster movies. And uh, Martin's picture reminds me always of of this scene in, two, uh, in 2012, where we get to watch Santa Monica sliding into the Pacific. I wanted to show that um, the other great volcano in Europe was also depicted, but much less than Vesuvius. Uh, Mount Etna on Sicily, uh, relatively few artists got down to Sicily uh, to depict it. And in my estimation, the very finest views of Etna were created by the American Thomas Cole, whose uh, oxbow uh, in the Connecticut River you saw earlier. This is a few years after that. He visited Sicily and painted several magnificent views. Here we see the ruins at Taormina um, and I just want to take this quick aside to urge all of you, especially all you young people out there, um, this is, Sicily is one of the great experiences. There's great scenery, great art of all epochs, and really great food and wine. And I just want to point out down here, there are beaches where in the middle of the beach, just maybe 40 feet from the, the Mediterranean, you find natural springs, not hot springs, cold springs. 
The other great thing for all you volcano nuts out there is that in winter you can ski at night. Uh, one of the reasons it isn't portrayed as much as Vesuvius is that it is almost constantly erupting. And so the eruptions are very slight. You don't have very often at least the great impressive eruptions uh, that uh, were true at Vesuvius for 300 years. You can go up and ski in the winter, but in the summer you can drive up to where the ski lifts are and they'll take you almost to the top where you can get out and walk or take vehicles with 20 foot tires uh, 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 up to the top. Um, and it is one of the greatest experiences that uh, I can remember. So here we have American artists going off to Europe uh, to portray volcanoes. And here, here's church again, in this case, making the journey to Ecuador to portray Cotopaxi, a 20,000 or almost 20,000 foot volcano um, that went off just a few years ago, uh, but is an absolutely magnificent uh, conical shape. And church created these pictures on a, a very large scale in his New York studio after studying them in the Andes, and he would create happenings in galleries. And pictures like this would be displayed in darkened rooms with lamp light very carefully adjusted on them so that people could pay 25 cents. That's in, in the mid 19th century, that's about as much as it would cost you to visit an art exhibition in a museum today. Um, and they would get their experience of the sublime through the viewing of a work of art. Now, back to uh, Mount St. Helens. Hank Pander portrayed it. This is the eruption of July 22nd, uh, seen against a, a beautiful summer sky. And it's one of the most wonderful depictions of the, uh, the eruption. And it normally resides in a conference room in City Hall where very few get to see it. So the show is up through the 3rd of January and I, and I hope uh, those of you who feel safe uh, will come out to see the show as a whole and, and this wonderful painting. Um, in this picture, Hank juxtaposes this great, great plume, uh, virtually covering the area of Portland against a cityscape and all the things of humans that are dwarfed by this uh, incredible event. In the foregrounds are the polished things of, of humans and on the table are two devices two devices of observation, just as the painting you know, is observing uh, the scene. One to view it close up and in the little miniature television, we have represented what is known as the technological sublime. The technological sublime has been discussed by thinkers since the 19th century. And of course, as technology de develops, it, it is an evolving uh, uh, discussion. Uh, just to give a little context, um, these little miniature televisions were all the rage in the late 70s and early 80s. And they're the first example of the extreme miniaturization of components being combined in a consumer product. And so something sublime uh, in and of itself. And I just wanna take a quick side for a personal rem uh, mem remembrance of my, one of my greatest experiences of the sublime and by far my greatest experience of the technological sublime. And that was, uh, I just graduated from high school and, and went up the coast uh, to watch the launch of Apollo 11. And 
this is seared in my mind. This is a photograph from Life magazine because I had my camera in my hands, but it didn't even occur to me until it, the rocket was almost gone that to take my eyes off of what was going, going on watching this skyscraper rise into the sky with the noise, the vibrations, and a brilliant display of smoke out to the sides. Uh, so the technological sublime. It's very appropriate in this picture and be beautifully used by Hank because the antenna connects directly to uh, the eruption plume and compositionally reduces this great, great uh, experience of nature down to a little two by two inch screen as if humans needed to re reduce this down to a level that wouldn't quite be so intimidating. The fear factor is also expressed a bit tongue in cheek in this work by Barbara Noah. Uh, she used a USGS photograph uh, of the eruption on May 18th, 1980 and inserted these two burning lava colored eyes into the eruption plume, making it like a wonderful monster um, to scare us. And you should visit our website and read uh, the artist's own description uh, of this work, but it's a beautiful 20th century uh, expression of the sublime in the eruption. I'm taking you back very briefly to uh, Church's cut epoxy here, because in the same vein, the next work that I'm going to show you, uh, tongue in cheek again, um, but also expressing um, our relationship with great events in nature. This is the digital map painter, Joshua Kays. These are artists who create the wonderful uh, backdrops and scenes, very real uh, seeming in the movies. And as you see here, look at the rock forms here. And then I'm going back to church. This isn't laid over church's painting. He recreated it here. And of course, the most significant addition is that firefighting helicopter heading off toward the volcano as if it was going to put this out. And it's a beautiful, funny expression of our fragility uh, when confronted with a great force of nature. And even with all of our technology, how impotent we are against such a force. I'll mention George Johansson real quickly. I'm running out of time. Um, and George made the eruption a leitmotif in his art. Whenever he depicts Portland, he shows Mount St. Helens most always erupting. And in this wonderful picture uh, in George land, uh, where mirrors are both reflective and transparent, um, we see Mount St. Helens erupting, but not at all naturalistically, because here we, we have a display of fireworks as well, a, a visual wonder on Portland's horizon. But no one, at least in the foreground, is paying much attention. It's only the painter uh, here in a self-portrait looking out. A great deal of the art in the exhibition is photography and some very, very great photography as well. And these works harken back to early photography, much earlier photography uh, of the great American West. I'm showing you here Carlton Watkins. This is one of my favorites. This we have down here at the bottom, there's a, a Sentinel Dome and these giant trees rising up from beneath and then beyond it going off seemingly into infinity uh, this majestic landscape a few uh, years so just a couple of years after um, he made this view uh, Watkins came up to the Pacific Northwest and and created some wonderful photographs of the Columbia River Gorge Cape Horn 
But to my knowledge, he never, he did portray Mount Hood, but he never photographed uh, Mount St. Helens. And I'd like for all of you to contemplate that with me. I, I, I've wondered about the relative dearth of imagery. Um, and I wonder if it wasn't atmospheric conditions uh, that to, to show the whole mountain, one needed to get a bit of a distance away. And we know, those of us who live in the area, that Mount St. Helens is not out as often um, as Mount Hood. And maybe it's as simple as that. And maybe it is that people related to Mount Hood more. Um, I'm gonna really skirt a magnificent topic here, um, beautiful art photography of the Columbia River Gorge. But let me refer you to this book. Um, you can still uh, get it from our uh, shop and uh, other sources. Um, published by Oregon State University Press in conjunction with an exhibition at the, uh, at the museum organized by Terry Totemeyer, uh, the late uh, curator of photography at the museum. Um, so for images of the Columbia Gorge, by all means, pick yourself up, up a copy of this book uh, and you will be thrilled with it. Before moving into Mount St. Helens, I'll also mention the great Ansel Adams in the 20th century, uh, portraying the American West. Again, as, it, as with the painters in the 18th and 19th centuries, light uh, is one of the primary motifs. And this great view of another volcano uh, in the Room of Fire, Denali, magnificently juxtaposed in its white majesty with this, uh, uh, the reflections on this body of water in the foreground. The great landscape photographers who uh, came to Mount St. Helens were confronted with a rather unique scene. Um, the scoured earth north of the volcano most profoundly. Emmett Gowan had a fellowship from the state of Washington in 1980 and was running around the state photographing. And uh, once the mountain blew, um, his attention uh, was diverted. Frank Goldke, another great American landscape photographer, also came. Uh, and both artists returned year after year. Um, to record the effects and the passage of time in uh, the years after the eruption. Here we're looking north from the volcano, that Spirit Lake in the upper right-hand corner. Again, the, the scour down to the bedrock. Emmett Gowan again. One thing I should uh, re remark on very quickly is that at first, um, uh, uh, things could only be gotten uh, via aerial photography until it was safe to let people in. But this haunting photograph shows the effect of ash. This is the confluence of the Cowlitz River with the Columbia. You can see uh, them transporting uh, trees on the Columbia down here. But other than that and uh, the road at the top, this is all but abstract in this absolutely magnificent uh, display. And note the date. This is four years after the eruption. This is back in 1980, uh, an aerial photograph that shows the ash-laden uh, Toodle River, uh, virtually a river of cement. And the blowdown of old growth forests on the slopes. That blowdown became a major leitmotif for photographers. And indeed, it is breathtaking um, in its expression of nature's power to blow over these grand trees like they were twigs. Artists savored their patterns. Here you, you see an eddy that existed within the blast. And I wish someone would tell me what this uh, hand shadow 
really is. I've not been able to sort it out, but it's very mysterious. Spirit Lake in 1980, virtual island of, of logs. It was many years later in 2009 that uh, Diane Cook and Lynn Jensel happened on this scene shortly after the logs were dusted with snow uh, to create this absolutely magnificent view of, of the mountain uh, with Spirit Lake. And also expressing a bit of the sublime uh, comes when you realize that those are not twigs uh, floating in the lake. They are absolutely gigantic uh, old growth trees here beautifully um, set into context by Buzzy Sullivan. Also, um, back to Hank Pander who painted the uh, wonderful eruption in City Hall. Um, Hank was completely fascinated by uh, the mountain before the eruption, uh, then with the eruption and the aftermath. Um, um, he's a Dutchman. Um, he's been here uh, 50 years, um, but very much a Dutchman. And, and as uh, he always loves to say, um, volcanoes were, are about as un-Dutch as it gets. Uh, for those of you who've traveled there, you couldn't imagine a flatter landscape. Um, Anyway, he was a great friend of the Portland author, Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, who is famous for her uh, science fiction and fantasy. And they managed to glean an early pass into the red zone around the mountain. And he portrays her in this large 50 inch wide drawing um, in pen and ink, um, reaching out almost in disbelief at the scene uh, that she's confronted with. And to underscore the sublimity of this moment, Hank inserts this depiction of the sixth moon of Saturn, Enceladus. Um, and the reason for it was Ursula Le Guin loved to imagine life on other worlds. And they were both fascinated with space. And at the time of their visit in October of 1981, Voyager 2 was transmitting back the first close-up pictures of Enceladus, a tantalizing scientists. Um, and so it looms in the background and making this an absolutely uh, a wonderful expression of the sublime in art. Um, we should say very quickly, uh, I'm running out of time, uh, we should say very quickly that um, in time, the technological sublime has increased our knowledge of Enceladus and it has become even more appropriate for Le Guin um, because they were able to maneuver Cassini through one of the ice geysers emanating from the surface of the moon, and they discovered salt water. So scientists are really tantalized by this. Underneath the, the layer of ice is a vast under, uh, under ice ocean, and uh, scientists are imagining primitive forms of life all existing there. The experience of the crater um, in this case by air, um, is one of incredible majesty. About eight years after he uh, took this photograph of the crater, Frank Golke was able to set foot in the crater and snapped this photograph, one of my favorite in the show, um, that depicts a, a rock fall um, in the crater. He, he describes it as a truly otherworldly experience existing there. For Brad Johnson, who lives virtually in the shadow of Mount St. Uh, Helens out in Trout Lake, um, the experience of the crater and his photographs made within the crater quite 
didn't sum up the experience. The, the experience was much more profound uh, for him. So he set off to express it. And his title, Mount St. Helens Thin Place, um, refers to the Celtic idea that there are places on the earth where the division between uh, the earth and heaven are very, very thin. And of course, uh, uh, the divisions between heaven and earth, but also the divisions between earth and hell. And one could imagine in looking out at this image that it's a, a whirling tornado or the, the, an, an abstract eruption plume or a volcano set on its head. But in fact, Brad was referring uh, to this work of art from the 1480s uh, made by Sandro Botticelli, illustrating Dante's description uh, of the map of hell. In trying to express the feelings that, that are aroused when he visits the crater, uh, Brad has moved on from this. And I'm, I urge you to visit his website uh, uh, to look more uh, thoroughly at um, his obsession uh, with Mount St. Helens. And, but uh, I just thought I'd show you one more. This is Mount St. Helens Thin Place Black Hole. Magisterial landscapes were, of course, created uh, by the eruption. Um, uh, Lewitt Falls didn't exist then. And in this wonderful photograph by Buzzy Sullivan, um, it, it just is so beautifully composed almost black and white, except for that one patch of green it left um, uh, with life uh, returning uh, to this area very close to the uh, lava dome. Cook and Gensel, again light, and particularly, particularly light at the end of the day, um, is a part of the expression of the sublime in art. And, and here the color of the, the, uh, the Roosevelt L juxtaposed with the warmth of the landscape and the coolness on which they're scrambling is, is absolutely magnificent. And I thought we'd come back to the, the tootle here. Um, and here we are. Um, uh, uh, almost 30 years after that ash-laden tootle uh, scene of Emmett Gowans. We're at a very different spot here, but um, again, light, evening light, playing a, a real role uh, in expressing the sublime in nature. I'm going to close tonight with um, the largest work of art in the exhibition, uh, this depiction of the Mountain by Cameron Martin. Uh, Martin was born and raised in Seattle, um, got to know the mountain uh, well, uh, remembers he was 10 when it erupted. Um, and in this work, the very largest that he has ever painted, um, um, he depicts the mountain in a very unique way. Um, and it's meant to play on all kinds of associations. I'm just to illustrate the scale. Uh, there it is in the show. I'm, I'm and with this work. I'm really sorry. I uh, I didn't have the room to give it a, a space completely and all to itself because it's one that you really have to stand before and move both from a distance up close again and again to fully uh, take in. Uh, the metaphors of the changeable, unpredictable Mount St. Helens, as expressed by the artist. In this picture, we see the mountain, and he, Martin used advertising imagery a lot you know, in, in his works of art. And he's playing off of our knowledge of near images to this. So, most prominently, the Paramount Pictures logo. It's gone through uh, many manifestations over the years. Uh, uh, people argue about what mountain it represents. Uh, doesn't really matter uh, in this context. It's seared in, in our memory. And 
Martin's work also references many postcards created um, since the eruption, as well as numerous views of the mountain um, uh, made by people. Um, these all gleaned from the internet. Um, and as you'll see, most of these people have been viewing uh, the scene from the Johnson Observatory and not really venturing any farther west to get this view into the crater. I want to mention one other uh, prominent visual uh, source in this great uh, photo by uh, Lynn, Lynn Topinka uh, for, uh, of the USGS. Um, I had this as a screensaver for years. Uh, but I'm going to go back again, show Martin's picture, and on to another photograph because you see Martin is sitting at a place. Martin's point of view is roughly from the area of Spirit Lake, uh, so a bit farther to the west than all the others that we've seen. And he limits himself to black, white, and gray with a, a little bit of color uh, thrown in particularly at uh, the top, atmospherically. Um, it's a painting that is very difficult to judge um, in this context, uh, projected on a screen like this. You, you really need to see this work of art because from a distance, the black that defines the mountain reads as solid. But as you approach the painting, um, that black, shifts to read as void. And so there's no real way for the eye to manage to resolve this contradiction. And in this way, uh, Martin expresses uh, the uh, instability of Mount St. Helens. And we see that reflected in the title as well. He likens the mountain to a human body with an incurable disease that could return uh, at any time. And of course, Mount St. Helens will erupt again. And I'm going to leave you with that. Um, and hopefully the questions will help me fess out and be a little more specific uh, about the sublime. Taylor? Hi, Dawson. Hi. We'll just go ahead and stop your screen share so we can get to some of these questions. What if I need it to illustrate something? Then we'll be happy to pull it back up. Okay. Um, thank you so much for, for that excellent presentation. You know, I was familiar with a lot of the pieces that you showed because I was able to visit the art exhibit earlier this spring um, or winter, I guess. Um, and, but it was great to see it interwoven with all, all of those different pieces. So thanks for sharing. One question from the audience was, you know, how can people see the exhibit? How long is it gonna be up at Portland Art Museum? And um, I believe that Pam also posted in the chat how to see it virtually. But if you could tell us a little bit more about that. The exhibition has been extended. Um, we closed down on the 14th of March, uh, and that was just about six weeks into the run. So about half the run uh, that had been planned. And I'm happy to tell you the exhibition is going to run through the 3rd of, of January, and that every single lender in the show um, has been incredibly generous in uh, letting us extend uh, the loans of their works. So the exhibition is complete and there is nothing quite like uh, the experience of works of art in the flesh. I've tried to emphasize that again and again here and uh, uh, because you can savor them on your screen, but nothing like uh, what you can in person. We're open Tuesday through Sunday and you would be strongly advised to reserve. We have not been overburdened with visitors. Um, 
there was a great deal of planning that went into the reopening and um, masks are required as is social distancing, reservations are preferred, although you can walk up because we're not uh, being overburdened with visitors, at least at this moment. We're getting on average about 125 people a day. Now, that's how many people we would let in in 15 minutes and uh, on a normal day. We, could, we can have thousands on a weekend, um, but we're only seeing about 125 a day. So social distancing really is possible. Um, cleaning is going on, there are mavens at it. And uh, so for those who feel safe enough, um, the museum is a, a great place to visit at this moment. And I highly recommend the exhibit for anyone who hasn't been able to, to visit in person yet. It's truly spectacular and Dossa did a great job of bringing it to life on screen, but it, it's a different experience seeing it in person. And Dawson, you had shared with Mount St. Helens Institute staff when you led us around the exhibit a little bit about your personal story, but I would love to hear more about what's your connection to Mount St. Helens? Why did you choose to make this exhibit? I've been fascinated with volcanoes since I was a kid. My, my dad brought me home. They're very, they, it was very crude compared to what kids uh, get to play with today, but he brought me home one of those little kits where you mix baking soda and vinegar uh, to, to produce an eruption. And it came along with a little book and that piqued an interest. I think I was probably five or six years old at the time. And um, I've always been fascinated. And I didn't really realize when I was that young just how visual I am, how, how much um, uh, I enjoy brilliant visuals. But of course, that was a, a lot of the attraction. And one of the things that got cut out today, um, uh, as it was, I, I had trouble getting through in an hour and I was motor mouthing it there at the end, um, <laughs> but um, were the Hawaiian volcanoes. Uh, the, there's a school of, of uh, late 19th century and early 20th century artists uh, portraying uh, eruptions, the very different eruptions in, in Hawaii that got skirted over today. Um, and I was in Madrid in 1980 on the 18th of, uh, of May, but it was big news there, captured my attention. And when the job at the Portland Art Museum came up, one of the things, and I'm, I'm really, I, I'm ver being very honest in this, one of the things that attracted me to it was the thought that I'd be able to live among these volcanoes. And uh, so I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And uh, um, I won't say I, I, I want to witness an eruption because I might get lynched, but uh, anyway, that's my backstory. Yeah, I just love hearing people's connection to Mount St. Helens because it really does have sort of a cult following in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> you know, one thing that I didn't get said there at the end, looking at Cameron Martin's big picture is, I hugely respect um, the sorrow felt by people who knew the mountain intimately before the eruption, those who had houses, those who went to summer camp on Spirit Lake and the like. And um, I often hear people um, describing the mountain as being um, a horrible uh, uh, reflection of the mountain at that time, uh, uh, greatly scarred and the like. But when I visit it, that's not what I experience, never having seen uh, uh, the place pre-eruption. It is still an awesome experience, both for the scale and really I find majestic beauty in that great amphitheater with the lava dome growing inside, now surrounded uh, by that thick, thick glacier. I think, is, isn't it the only place on the earth where glaciers are growing? Well, it's certainly the only place in the lower 48 of the United States where Crater Glacier, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the topography, Crater Glacier is a glacier that is inside Mount St. Helens that is growing um, at a pretty remarkable rate. And I believe a few years ago when I accompanied a geologist inside the crater, it was, gosh, 
three meters different than the year before. Um, oh, so wow. Quite significant. Um, and that brings me to another question, Dawson, of that, you know, we as non-Indigenous people often think of eruptions as destructive, but those who have been here for millennia know that eruptions are actually periods of astounding growth and rebirth. And how do you see that reflected in, in art about Mount St. Helens or art about other volcanoes? You, of course, see it uh, uh, in the beautiful photographs of life returning uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to the mountain um, and things settling down. Um, but also in wonderful works like Buzzy Sullivan's of Lewitt Falls, where beautiful new landscapes were created by the eruption and uh, are there and ever evolving. And of course, they will continue to evolve. And we have somebody who's watching from, um, from Mexico, and they wanted to ask you if you're familiar with the, the paintings of Dr. Otto. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. If you don't know the paintings of Dr. Otto, do go. Uh, and have a look because he created uh, some absolutely magnificent uh, depictions of volcanoes. So um, uh, I urge you, that's a, that's a wonderful tip. Thank you down to uh, uh, our friends south of the border. And another question from the chat is, do you believe that the sublime always contains beauty or can it be pure terror? Oh, it can be pure terror, absolutely. Uh, as I said, the sublime is a really slippery term and it really depends on who's using it, when, but even within a given time period, philosophers greatly argue about the specifics. Um, and one thing that I have really fallen down on is I meant to have a final slide, but let me tell folks, if you're interested in exploring the sublime, particularly as it intersects with art, go to the website of Tate, T-A-T-E, Britain. The Tate is uh, not just a British, uh, a gallery of British art, there's a Tate Modern as well. Um, but if you go to the Tate website in Britain and just search on sublime in art, and it will take you to a very large section. It represents the work of a three and a half year research project at the Tate into the sublime and particularly um, um, the sublime in Britain, although not, so, not solely. And there's a lot of wonderful material about the many different faces of the sublime, um, as well as the work of philosophers and specialists in aesthetics. And there's a very fine bibliography that will lead you um, to further uh, sources. So go to this, uh, the Tate website, Art uh, uh, Sublime in Art, and uh, you'll be able to go from there. And somebody knew that today is your birthday and you chose to share it with us. And so if, for those of you watching, just wish Dawson Carr, our wonderful curator, happy birthday in the comments. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I told you I wouldn't embarrass you too much, but I saved it till the very end. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. And again, I, I can't express the gratitude that I feel, along with uh, Stephanie Parrish uh, in the Learning and Community Partnerships Department, um, and all of, this who, all of us who worked on the exhibition and its programs at the Portland Art Museum for the participation of the Institute, you've been absolutely magnificent partners and uh, we're so grateful. It wouldn't have been nearly so good uh, uh, an experience without you. I'm sorry we, your programs were shut down because they <laughs> involved a lot of touching of objects. Um, but anyway, um, and just one really special thank, thank you to Abby Grosskopf for keeping me accurate. <laughs> For those of you who aren't familiar, Abby Groskopf is our um, 
our programs director at the Mount St. Helens Institute. And we are just so honored to be a partner with the Portland Art Museum. And we look forward to many more programs in the future together, hopefully in person down the line. Yeah. <laughs> and if you aren't able to visit the exhibit in person, we did put a link in that chat so that you can explore all of the pieces that Dawson had talked about during tonight's presentation on your own. Um, that's a really amazing resource to make the museum really accessible to folks. So make sure that you check that out. Dawson, thank you so much for all of you watching. Thank you. We really appreciated it. Um, we have more views and brews coming up down the line. So make sure that you follow Mount St. Helens Institute on social media and Portland Art Museum um, so that you can see other collaborations like this and other um, programs, both virtual and in-person, that both PAM and MSHI are doing. Um, a few last announcements. We also have in-person COVID conscious mushroom foraging trips with Mount St. Helens Institute in September and October. Dawson, have you gone mushroom foraging before? Oh no, I would love to. Well, maybe we have to set that up. Uh, these are going to be oh. really amazing trips. You know, the rain is just around the corner and I know people don't like that, but it means that the mushrooms are fruiting in the forest. So feel free to check out our website, mshinstitute.org for more information about mushroom foraging. And we have lots of resources on the MSHI website, as well as the Portland Art Museum. Um, once again, Dawson, thank you so much. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.